and Mass Culture, Chapter 4, The Baroque, from Revolution in the Church, to Revolutions in U.S. and France, to the Industrial Revolution. And this is Part 1. Here is a, a detail of Bernini, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa, which is one of his very famous sculptures. The Baroque, Part 1. In this lecture, we will take a very brief look at the philosophical, scientific, political, and religious revolutions which started during the Baroque period. We will briefly review linear perspective, and we will focus on four prominent art and architectural works from the early to high Baroque period. The first is Caravaggio, a painting called the Deposition, or sometimes called the Entombment, from around 1600, and this is a very large painting, which is about 10 by 7 feet. We will next look at Artemisia Gentileschi, another painting entitled Judith and Holofernes, and this is from about 1620, and again, a very large painting, about 5 by 7 feet. Uh, then we will look at Bernini, The Ecstasy of St. Teresa, from about 1650, and this is sculpture and architecture and painting, and um, it is installed in the Coronaro uh, Chapel in Rome. And we will finish with the Chateau de Versailles, Versailles Palace, the Hall of Mirrors, and this was uh, de uh, installed around 1680, and again, it, this is a work of architecture with painting and sculpture. These last two pieces are very much art installed installations that engulf and surround the viewer, creating a multi-sensorial, corporeal art experience. And that's very much one of the hallmarks of the Baroque period. The Baroque. The Baroque is the historical era that begins with the Counter-Reformation. The Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation initiated by Martin Luther and comes to an end as world-shaking revolutions, both political and industrial, sweep over Europe and the Americas. The Baroque is known for its extreme and conflictual differences. In some parts of Europe, absolute monarchs possessed ostentatious, great wealth, and increasingly oppressed their subjects. In other parts of Europe, the middle class was on the rise, and the capitalist economy was gaining strength. Technological innovations made the Baroque an increasingly mechanized era, yet the artwork it produced was both sensual and spiritual. The Baroque period was an era of remarkable contrasts. The Baroque, a complex and contradictory time. In most of Southern Europe, the Catholic Church was the dominant religious institution. The Catholic Church was going through the Counter-Reformation, with calls to reform aspects of the church, including luxurious living on the part of the clergy, the appointment of relatives to church office, and the absence of bishops from their dioceses. In most places in Southern Europe, absolutist monarchies, that is, kings who had absolute power over their subjects, were in charge. In the North, Protestantism was on the rise alongside growing capitalism. The Baroque, widely divergent art forms. Widely divergent arts were created in service of the church, absolutist monarchs, and Northern European burghers. In the cultural display of the South, the desire to evoke emotional states, this is gonna be really important, evoking emotional states, by appealing to the senses, often in dramatic ways, led to grandeur, sensuous richness, drama, vitality, movement, tension, emotional exuberance, and a tendency to blur the distinction between the various arts. So remember I mentioned uh, Bernini with sculpture and painting, all of that coming together. This tendency can be seen, for example, in the grandiose spectacles designed for Louis XIV at Versailles, and this, of course, includes the Hall of Mirrors. In contrast, much of Northern European art was rather restrained and austere, like the quiet, middle-class gestures of Dutch painter Jan Vermeer. The Baroque, philosophical revolution, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. 
Descartes and Galileo conceptualized a new way of thinking about nature that was not based on Greek philosophy or church tenets, but on reason and the analysis of physical laws. French philosopher René Descartes, considered one of the founders of modern philosophy, famously declared, I think, therefore I am. By declaring that his ability to think in his rational mind formed his identity, rather than his experience of his corporeal body, Descartes split the intellect, or the mind, from the physical, or the body, and created the mind-body binary opposition pair, which we still struggle with today. The focus on the rational extended to Baroque sciences as well. Scientific Revolution one way to understand the impact of Baroque scientific innovations is to look at the period's response to Ptolemy's assertion in 150 AD, or CE, that the Earth was the center of the universe. During the Renaissance, Nicholas uh, Copernicus had written that the Earth and the planets revolved around the sun. Copernicus' revolutionary thesis had little impact until, during the Baroque period, Johannes Kepler published his Laws of Planetary Motion. A few years later, Galileo Galilei began looking at the surface of the moon through a telescope and announced his findings. Kepler and Galileo's new scientific ideas rekindled ideological conflicts. Galileo was brought to Rome, tried by the Catholic Church, forced to read a falsified confession, and remained under house arrest until his death in 1642. So he paid a heavy price um, for declaring something that we now, uh, you know, just consider as a fact. The Baroque period of scientific innovation. In addition to the telescope, Baroque scientists also developed and used the microscope, the thermometer, and the barometer in their investigations. And new projective technologies like the camera obscura were developed that would soon democratize image production. Political revolutions. By the 18th century, social discontent was organized into massive uprising that crossed class lines and initiated wide changes in social and political practices. The first was the American Revolution for Independence from England in 1776. It was soon followed by the French Revolution, begun in 1789 and ended in the late 1790s, which unfolded throughout the last two decades of the 18th century and into the first of the 19th. Religious Reform Re Revolution, Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation started by Martin Luther in 1517 was a major movement within Western Christianity in Europe that posed a religious and political challenge to the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church was being challenged and we're going to see how the Catholic Church reacts in um, response to this. The, this movement challenged the authority of the Pope arising from what were perceived to be errors, abuses, and discrepancies by the Catholic Church. The Reformation was the start of Protestantism and the split of the Western Church into Protestantism and what is now the Roman Catholic Church. Religious Rev Revolution, Protestant Reformation. The Catholic Church was worried about challenges to its power and about losing members to the Protestant faith. And so, the Catholic Church began a process of self-examination and change to its own policies and doctrines. This was called the Counter-Reformation. So we have the Protestant Reformation and the Counter-Reformation by the Catholic Church. During the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church once again began to strictly dominate and eliminate any voices who challenged its beliefs. This was done by an official church body called the Inquisition. Books which questioned or challenged the beliefs of the Catholic Church were banned. And the visual arts were also examined. A new set of rules was issued to control the production of religious art by 
the Council of Trent, a group of church officials who met to discuss the changes to the church. Cardinal Paleoletti's Decorum. The Catholic Church issued rules to control the production of religious art, and you know how much artists like to be controlled. These rules were part of Cardinal Paleoletti's Decorum. So it was called the Decorum. A detailed discussion of what was and wasn't acceptable in religious art was laid out by the Catholic Church. And again, I will say, you know how much artists like to follow rules. Nudity and eroticism were out. Anything faintly tinted with heretical incorrectness was anathema, or uh, something that went directly against the church. Nothing from real life was to intrude that might diminish or de distract from the improving and uplifting image. Dignity was essential. Humor was banned. So was fantasy. We'll see about that. Anything new of any kind was banned. And again, I just say, have you met any artists recently? By 1597, an index of prohibited images was issued. The Catholic Church issues rules to control the production of religious art. However, as the Baroque progressed, the Catholic Church shifted from restraining and admonishing worshipers to trying to attract them. Aware that most Christians were illiterate, in other words, they couldn't read, the church fathers emphasized that the visual arts, rather than printed text, because if, if people can't read, the printed text is not going to do very much, so they, just, they correctly decided or astutely decided that the visual arts should speak to the masses. They declared that the purpose of religious art was to teach and inspire the faithful and to serve as propaganda for the Roman Catholic Church. Religious art should always be intelligible and realistic, and above all, it should serve as an emotional stimul stimulus to piety or devotion to God. So they're seeing how the visual arts are going to be able to persuade people um, through the content of the artwork. Baroque culture revolved around painting. In its efforts to propagate the message of the Counter-Reformation through art, Rome, the capital city of the Catholic Church, became, quote, the world's great image factory. So this was a, quite a time in the production of artwork. In the Baroque society whose culture, quote, revolved around painting, People flocked to see the paintings newly installed in public venues, just as they flocked to see newly released movies today, or will again very soon, we hope. Review of Linear Perspective. The development of linear perspective. So linear perspective, as you will recall, is a system of creating an illusion of depth on a flat surface. All parallel lines, which are called orthogonals, in a painting or drawing using this system converge on a, in a single vanishing point on the composition's horizon line. The three components essential to the linear perspective system are orthogonals, or these parallel lines, the horizon line, and a vanishing point. So as to appear farther from the viewer, Objects in the compositions are rendered increasingly smaller as they get nearer the vanishing point, and this creates this illusion of three-dimensional depth on a two-dimensional plane. All right, so first we're going to talk about Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio, who is, for the most part, known as Caravaggio. So he was from that region, and he's known as Caravaggio. One of the artists who portrayed the emotional passion of counter-reformation Catholicism was Caravaggio. One of the most popular painters of the early counter-reformation was Michelangelo Marisi, uh, known as Caravaggio from the name of his home region of Italy. Caravaggio was also one of the counter-reformation's most controversial artists. So remember all of those rules that the Catholic Church had? Caravaggio took great delight in violating those rules. 
He painted in the style known as naturalism, which meant he repeatedly violated the terms of Cardinal Paleoletti's decorum. He was also prone to outbursts of violence. Accounts of his many encounters with the police were reported in the, v in the Avisi, the Roman precursors to mo modern newspapers. Like Leonardo da Vinci before him, Caravaggio has become a cultural icon. Caravaggio is known as the violent, passionate, uncontrollable, creative genius. Caravaggio, shifting vanishing point. The work of Michelangelo de Caravaggio introduced the Baroque spirit into painting. His art inspired Baroque painters in Northern and Southern Europe by dramatically shifting the vanishing point toward the spectator. Renaissance artists like Leonardo had used the central vanishing point to create a stable, balanced image. Caravaggio shifted the vanishing point, the light source, and the main characters in the action away from the center of the painting. His paintings brought the viewer into the scene with some of the boldness that we now experience with the moving angle shots used by cameras in movie and television productions. And so the first painting that we're going to look at by Caravaggio is called The Deposition or The Entombment. And this is from uh, about 1604, oil on canvas, and again, a very large, um, a very large painting. Caravaggio, The Deposition or The Entombment. In about 1600, Girolamo uh, Vitrisi hired Caravaggio to paint a deposition or entombment, which is an image of Christ being taken down from the cross for his family chapel in Santa Maria Vallecella in Rome. Uh, Caravaggio chose to uh, paint Jesus being laid on the stone with which the tomb would be closed. And you can see that his hand just barely brushes against that um, that stone there. Christ is surrounded by four figures. Um, his mother, Mary Magdalene, Nicodemus, and Mary of Cleophas, um, who is raising her hands, her arms to heaven. And um, the deposition shows how Caravaggio's use of a below center vanishing point produced a dramatic encounter between the viewer and Christ. Instead of being placed in an idealized central position, the viewer is placed below the scene and watches the awkward attempt to remove the body of Christ for burial. The rough, homely features of the peasant holding Christ's legs and the plain, ordinary clothing of the grief-stricken women adds to the immediacy of the scene. Caravaggio's use of ordinary people in ordinary dress also decreased the psychological distance between the sacred space of the painting and the private space of the individual believer. You might compare this to Leonardo's Da Vinci's upscaling the disciples and Jesus in his painting of the Last Supper. Da Vinci instead chose to portray Jesus and his disciples as wealthy members of Renaissance society. Which artistic decision is more compelling for you as the viewer of these two artworks? The less stable point of view forces the viewer's eyes to move continuously within the scene and gives the painting its momentary, almost journalistic quality. Compared with the static, distant figures and idealized central space of Renaissance paintings, the deposition seems like a photograph taken of a dramatically lit theater stage. And again, these are all things that Baroque, the Baroque era is known for. This very immediate sense, this engulfing you in, as the viewer into the painting. 
Caravaggio's use of mirrors and compasses. So we're going to increasingly see artists using tools um, to uh, get the perspective right and to see what they want to paint um, in their paintings. Caravaggio employed all of the advances of the growing science of optics in his own work. In order to control the light, Caravaggio arranged the figures, and these are usually models that he hired from the urban underclass, in his dark studio. He illuminated them with light from a single window, which was usually to the upper left, and he even got into trouble with one landlady. The place he stayed didn't have a window, so he just cut one into the wall. Documents indicate that Caravaggio used mirrors to project images onto his canvases and compasses to measure aspects of his composition. So increasingly we're going to see artists using tools in order to get their paintings to look the way that they want them to. It's also possible that Caravaggio knew about the camera obscura. Caravaggio's far-reaching influence whether or not Caravaggio used technology to assist him, his images stand as some of the most powerful statements of European religious art. The iconic impact of his work was especially important at the beginning of the 17th century. Catholic art at this time sought to provide a greater sense of personal involvement for believers, similar to that offered by the Protestant approach of individual interpretation of the Bible. So both of these religious groups are trying to draw in their believers by offering them more of a sense of personal involvement. Catholic artists like Caravaggio and his followers, the Caravaggisti, um, sought ways to combine the long tradition of communal art in churches with the new need for a greater sense of the personal. Caravaggio's followers spread his style throughout Catholic Europe as churches increasingly deployed art to convey their messages. All right, so now we're moving on to Artemisia Gentileschi. Yes, she is a woman. Uh, one of Caravaggio's most outstanding followers was the daughter of his Roman friend Orazio Gentileschi. One of the men who had been arrested and charged with street balling alongside the more famous painter, Orazio Gentileschi adopted Caravaggio's remarkable naturalistic style and passed it on to his gifted daughter, Artemisia Gentileschi. It was Artemisia who transmitted Caravaggesque naturalism throughout the Italian peninsula and beyond. She even worked in London for a little while. Born in Naples and raised in Bologna, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi was the first woman to join the Academy in Florence, where she became quite well known as a painter. She also worked in Rome and Naples. In the late 1630s, she was invited to join her father at the court of Charles I in London. And when her father died, um, she returned to Italy and continued painting. All right, and so this is her uh, large-scale painting, about five by six and a half feet, called Judith and Holofernes. She was a skilled painter of female nudes, and many of her paintings depict biblical and mythological heroines. Like Caravaggio, Artemisia Gentileschi did several versions of Judith and Holofernes, and this is a biblical account of a Jewish woman seducing, then beheading an Assyrian general in order to prevent his conquest of her people. The dramatic contrast of light and dark underscores the boldness of her compositions. Erotic and violent, Artemisia Gentileschi's Judith and Holofernes paintings demonstrate the effectiveness of strong emotional appeal in art. So again, this is one of the things that the Baroque period is known for, strong emotional appeal in art. Artemisia Gentileschi was not a feminist in the contemporary sense of the word, but she was aware of the difficulties facing a woman working in the field dominated by male practitioners. She accompanied the shipment of one painting to a patron with a note that said, quote, This will show your lordship what a woman can do, end quote. Later she wrote, quote, you will find the spirit of Caesar in the soul of this woman, end quote. 
All right, moving on now uh, to Bernini. Like Artemisia Gentileschi, Gian Lorenzo Bernini was born in Naples. Also like her, he first studied with his artist father. The Bernini family settled in Rome, where at age 19, the young artist captured the attention of an important patron, uh, Cardinal uh, Barberini. The Cardinal later became Pope Urban VII and uh, commissioned several of Bernini's major works. A devout Catholic, Ber Bernini attended Mass every day and took communion twice a week. And so this is something that um, people are going to mention about Bernini, about his faith and how strong his faith was and how he um, transformed his artwork, you know, through his faith. Bernini's influences. Scholars argue that the development of Bernini's art was, quote, largely determined by his conscientious efforts to conform to the principles of the Counter-Reformation. So that was very important for him. Unlike Caravaggio, who was constantly breaking the rules, Bernini really strove to, um, to understand the rules of the Counter-Reformation and to implement them in his artwork. Bernini was also strongly influenced by his close study of the antique Greek and Roman marble statues in the Vatican, so he had access to those, and he had intimate knowledge of high Renaissance painting, like that of Michelangelo, whose work he quoted in several early pieces. So in several of his early pieces, you can see figures that are standing in poses like those used by Michelangelo. Perhaps the biggest influence on Bernini, however, was the opera. Bernini and opera, a Baroque fusion of the arts to create an overwhelming, impressive whole, opera began in the early 17th century in, Europe, in Italy. Opera combined music, theater, and the visual arts into a spectacle in which elaborately costumed actors sang their lines. So again, this is a very Baroque kind of um, confluence of all these art forms. Classical myths were revisited, history retold, and imagination stimulated in opulent pageantry with exotic scenery. Opera employed the newest of artistic advances. A 1656 English dictionary noted that opera was, quote, adorned with scenes by perspective. Um, Germany imported opera in the later 1600s, as did France, where it flourished under Louis XIV. Several of Bernini's sculptural complexes can be seen as opera scenes in fixed form. So he was really influenced by watching these operas. Bernini often melded the visual arts of painting, sculpture, and architecture painting, sculpture, and architecture into what the Germans term Gesamtkunstwerk, let me try that again, Gesamtkunstwerk, or a total work of art, a total engulfing work of art. So now we're going to look at The Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini. Uh, the greatest example of this is his uh, Cornaro Chapel in uh, Santa Maria della Victoria in Rome. Commissioned by Cardinal Cornaro to decorate a shallow subsidiary space along the side of a small church, Bernini's Cornaro Chapel portrays the ecstasy of Saint Santa Teresa or Saint Teresa. Teresa of Avila was one of the most popular saints of the, the Counter-Reformation. Her writings were popular reading, especially her life from uh, 1562, in which she recounts her experiences of hearing internal voices and seeing inner visions. Perhaps her most rapturous account is found in chapter 29. Teresa tells of an angel appearing to her, a beautiful angel whose face appeared to be a flame. The ensuing text is one of the most ecstatic and sexual accounts of Christian mysticism. Teresa was a Carmelite nun who had taken a vow of chastity, and she clearly understood that religious sentiments are cited in the body. 
Bernini pr portrayed her ecstatic moment in visual terms that can only be described as orgasmic. A life-size saint and a cupid-like angel appear on a marble stage. So again, think about the opera. To either side are raised opera seats. So there's actually spectators on both sides of, of Teresa as she's having this, um, this uh, vision. Seven members of the Cornaro family lean in from their seats to witness the mystical, the mystical spectacle. Viewers are placed in front as audience members. So when you walk in, you walk in um, like you would to an opera house and you're seeing this on the stage. Bernini's charge blending of religious and erotic is incredibly accomplished. All right, and then I'll just show you a few. So this is the entire um, chapel and you can see above that there is a painted ceiling there's all of this amazing marble here is the central uh, statue with these golden rays of light and then you can see over on the sides the, the uh, galleries where the spectators are watching this happening and if you come in you stand in front of it as though this were all laid out on the stage for you so this is um, quite an amazing um, and beautiful um, chapel. So I'll just show you some um, pictures. But you can see all the different kinds of marble that they use with all different finishes. And uh, you can see the angel here with the arrow that the angel is about to plunge um, into Teresa's heart. And you can see all of this, the divine light coming down. And there you are, again, if you were a spectator, you would be standing here and you could see the marble um, uh, opera boxes, you know, with the opera viewers. And then you can see uh, the vision as it's unfolding in front of you. And this is the mystical vision that St. Teresa had. There they are watching. Several elements of Bernini's work may have been inspired by Caravaggio's artwork that Bernini had seen earlier in his life. However, consciously or unconsciously, uh, Bernini recalled elements of Caravaggio's paintings in his operatic sculptural ensemble. In a sim similar manner, today we take in media images, images from television, film, advertising, and they become a largely unconscious part of our behavioral repertory. So these images really become part of us. And there you can see uh, Teresa, her foot and her hand. Uh, the sensuous character of the ecstasy of St. Teresa aroused erotic associations and generated moral reservations from the second half of the 18th century, where they were much more conservative. However, for contemporaries, it had met all religious and moral requirements. So um, for Bernini's contemporaries, this artwork followed the decorum, the, the rules of the Counter-Reformation. It was but one in a long list of the artist's spectacular successes with both church and popular viewers. So the populace, the popular viewers loved it, and so did the church. Bernini traveled to Paris in 1665 at the invitation of Louis XIV. By this time, Bernini was so famous that crowds lined the streets of each city along the route to watch him pass. So I don't know if we have any artists who are that famous um, these days, but Bernini was one of them. When Bernini died at the age of 81, quote, he was widely considered not only Europe's greatest artist, but also one of its greatest men. All right, and now we're going to talk about our last um, piece of artwork, um, and this was commissioned by Louis XIV. Louis XIV's father had died when he was five, but he did not take the throne until he was 23. He then ruled as an absolute monarch until his death. Louis was a great patron of art and opera. He hung the Mona Lisa, famously hung the Mona Lisa in his bedroom. During his reign, the French dictated artistic tastes and fashions of Europe. France was an industrial leader when he took the throne, but there was marked economic decline as Louis' reign pr progressed. Um, he fought disastrous and expensive wars, which drained France economically. Uh, all right, let's talk about uh, Louis XIV, Versailles, and the Hall of Mirrors. 
Perhaps the greatest drain on the French economy, though, was Louis's insatiable architectural ambition. As soon as he became king, he began the enlargement of his country home in Versailles, which was uh, 11 miles outside of Paris. Now today, that doesn't seem like much at all, but back then, that was you know quite a ways from, from Paris, which was the sort of center of the country. Louis determined to make it the most spectacular showcase of French wealth and taste, and he succeeded. The jewel of the Versailles crown is the Hall of Mirrors. When Louis conceived of the hall, mirror making was a secret industry practiced only in Venice, Italy, and the secrets were guarded very closely. Louis sent spies to Venice to learn the trade, and he convinced mirror makers to come to France. In doing so, he not only ensured the visual splendor of his hall, he also acquired a successful new industry for his country. So just because he wanted to have these gorgeous um, mirrors in this hall, he, he did this whole thing where he sent spies out, learned about how to make, stole the secrets, got these guys to come, these mirror makers to come to France, um, all so that he could have this, this beautiful hall of mirrors. Uh, perhaps the greatest drain, oops. All right, and so let's look at um, some uh, images of the Hall of Mirrors in Versailles. And you can see, again, it's a, an intensely, overwhelmingly beautiful, uh, over-the-top spectacle that um, in, you encounter as you come in with these arched mirrors, I mean, with these arched windows, and the windows lead out to the gardens, and the gardens, um, the, the pools and the gardens are all placed so that they reflect in these mirrors. So you have all these mirrors across from these arched windows, which reflect the scenery that you see outside. He's got these amazing um, chandeliers that are hanging from the ceiling and all of the ceiling is painted with these incredible canvases which all celebrate yes you guessed it Louis the 14th and all of his um, his uh, accomplishments you've got all this you know amazing statues so it's quite quite the spectacle again with the marble on the walls these beautiful parquet floors and there you have a little a view of the, the chandeliers. And again, you can also see, see how um, these were canvases which were hand glued into place on the ceiling and all of this gilt. Um, there used to be more <laughs> tables made of silver, but those all got melted down uh, subsequently. And here's one of the, the paintings from the ceiling. All right. Um, what was the Hall of Mirrors used for? The king used the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles for various purposes. It served as a waiting room, uh, a meeting room for courtiers and visitors daily. And it was also the, a room where people would congregate and they would try to catch a glimpse of the king as he walked between these numerous rooms of his palace. And so you could see him reflected in the mirrors. The grandeur of the Hall of Mirrors was one of the ways that Louis XIV strove to main, maintain control of the courtiers at Versailles. The structure surrounds and overwhelms the viewer in typical Baroque fashion. The grandiose ensemble of the hall and its adjoining salons, so there was the Salon of Peace and the Salon of War, was intended to illustrate the power of the absolutist monarch Louis XIV. The Hall of Mirrors is flanked at the far ends by the Salon of War in the north and the Salon of Peace in the south, respectively. The mirror gallery connects the two salons. The mirror hall's 17 windows open in the direction of the park. On the opposite inside wall of the hall are 17 equally large mirrors that are composed of more than 350 individual mirror surfaces. On the one hand, the mirrors had an aesthetic function as the mirror image of the garden depicted in the exterior of the castle into the interior of the building and reflected the candlelight in the evening. On the other hand, the mirrors also conveyed the king's fabulous, enormous wealth 
and the efficiency of the French economy that he was able to steal these secrets from the Italians and gen you know bring this whole industry um, to France, the whole mirror um, making industry to France. The hall's grandeur is beside the mirrors, best perceived through the majesty of its vault. Nine large and numerous smaller ceiling paintings are depicted to the idolization of the Sun King. So Louis XIV was called the Sun King. And they praise the successes of the first 20 years of his reign. Charles Lebrun, which, who was designated the greatest French artist of all time, and this was, of course, according to King Louis XIV, was, unsurprisingly, the artist of choice for the ceiling paintings. And the most prestigious scenes were painted on strengthened canvas and glued to the vault by Lebrun himself, age 60, at the start of the work. The painting, The King Governs, him, Governs Himself, highlights the claim to absolute power. So instead of God governing the king, the, uh, Louis is asserting that he governs himself. And so this is his claim to uh, all this power that he wanted and kept. Every aspect of the Hall of Mirrors is dedicated to reinforcing Louis XIV's claims to absolute power in France. And again, here's another uh, image of this fantastic, opulent, decadent uh, beauty. The king considered his gardens not only as important as the palace, but as an important part but as an important part of the palace. Interior and exterior spaces were connected by large windows and also by carefully designed plays of light and shadow. The large reflecting pools, for example, are aligned to reflect the sun up and into the Hall of Mirrors, where it would be reflected and refracted in the 357 mirrors that line the wall opposite the row of windows overlooking the garden. So you can see that every aspect of this is carefully planned. The sunlight sparkling on the surfaces of the pools and fountains and twinkling along the Hall's mirrors would embody the power of Louis the Sun King. They would also provide pleasure for the king and his court. Indeed, the two are tied together. The ability of the king to command the creation of such a sublimely pleasurable space was a demonstration of his absolute power. So again, you want to think about how this is propaganda for Louis and his agenda. Eventually, Versailles was comprised of over 200 rooms, occupied by over 1,000 nobles, and served by over 4,000 workers. It was surrounded by a park that extended for several miles. Louis adorned both the palace and the park with art. In addition to opera and other stage dramas, Louis also prevent, presented tableau vivant, or living pictures, as entertainment for the courtiers that flocked to Versailles to curry favor. So up to 10,000 courtiers were at Versailles at one point. So uh, Louis determined to subordinate all of the arts to a single goal, and that is the glorification of himself. Like Roman emperors before him, he erected numerous equestrian sta uh, statues as symbols of royal authority, and he commissioned painters to execute numerous portraits, often created in multiples. His favorite portrait of himself was the 1700 standing portrait by Hyacinth Rigaud. And here it is. You can see him in all of his glory. And uh, his legs were considered his best feature, and so you can see that they're highlighted. Um, we're going to look at Versailles and the idea of propaganda and art. And I, I want to point out this is a close up of the, the lace cuff. Um, on uh, so this is a close-up of this incredible lace cuff on uh, Louis's garment. The Sun King, as Louis the Fourteenth modestly called himself, was arguably the most powerful and masculine figure of his era. Close examination of Louis's lace cuff reveals the astonishing realism of Rigaud's art. Even magnified several times, the details of the painting are so precise that they look like color photographs. This kind of realism, which produced an equivalence between the surface of things and their reproduction in oil paint, was the style that Louis XIV supported. It was a painting style that required arduous and lengthy training. 
In order to acquire such training, French artists attended the Royal Academy, which was run by who? Yes, run by Louis. Um, the Counter-Reformation revitalized the Florentine Academy, which trained artists in the 1590s, ostensibly to educate the artists, but really to establish more church control over art. So if you control the way that artists get trained, if you control the institutions that train the artists, then you can train them to produce the kind of art that you would like to see. In his efforts to centralize control over the arts, Louis XIV appointed the directors of the French Academy. So the French Academy was the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture and oversaw the establishment of a rigid curriculum based on a rationalist philosophy. So Louis uh, controlled the academy by appointing the directors and was very involved in the type of curriculum in the way that artists learn to paint. A brilliant, brilliant tactician, Louis XIV used academic painting as propaganda for his version of history. So if painting is the way that people are seeing the world visually, right, they didn't have any photographs or anything like that, um, if you control the way people are painting, then you can control what you want your version of history to be. Propaganda is a term which originated with the churches propagating or spreading the faith through art. Louis endeavored to shift the mythic base of culture from God to king. So the church started out by controlling the academy, right, and trying to control the way that art is painted. But Louis figured that out and took over that role and then tried to shift. Um, instead of saying that, you know, God is the, the basis of culture, he as the king would be the basis. Through his manipulation of the academy and its products, Louis XIV used art to propagate his reign's justification. How did he control art production in France? With Louis XIV in control of the Art Academy in France, which trained all or most of the notable artists, he was able to control art production in France by controlling the Academy. The Academy controlled French art in three ways. It set training and admission standards for its own uh, art school in Paris, the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. It sponsored annual or semi-annual salons. These public exhibitions were hugely important and popular. And if you wanted to be an artist of any kind of standing, you had to get into the public exhibition and then you had to be well received and well reviewed. And it controlled membership in the academy itself. So if you only let in the artists who are painting what you want them to paint, you have a lot, you're exercising a lot of control. Today, you might not think it would be a big deal if the government maintained tight control of all the work produced by the artists in the country, but imagine if artwork were the only visual medium that existed, and if the government maintained tight control of the artwork that was produced and used that for a very specific agenda. Um, for Louis XIV, his agenda was maintaining absolute control over all of France. All right, so let's just go for a few takeaway messages um, for the Baroque period. The art of persuasion. We want to instruct, delight, move people emotionally. So they're using artwork. They have a, a message that they want to convey, and they're using it to convey this to people. While the Protestants harshly criticized the cult of images or um, religious imagery, the Catholic Church ardently embraced the religious power of art. The visual arts, the Church argued, played a key role in guiding the faithful. They were certainly as important as the written and spoken word, and perhaps even more important since they were accessible to the learned and the unlearned alike. So whether you could read or not, you could look at artwork and learn from that. In order to be effective in its pastoral role, religious art had to be clear persuasive and powerful. Not only did it have to instruct, it had to inspire. It had to move the faithful to feel the reality of Christ's sacrifice, the suffering of the martyrs, and the visions of the saints. During the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church tightened the control it had on artists who produced religious art by controlling the academies which trained artists and sponsored important artistic exhibitions where artists could sell their work. Once Louis XIV realized that he could use that control for his own agenda, he began to use artistic production with one goal, 
to keep himself in power and to maintain absolute control of the monarchy in France. So we see the continuation of artwork used as propaganda to maintain political power. And once the French Revolution begins, the left will also use artwork as propaganda for their own cause. All right, it's very important um, for this um, uh, week. Um, please watch or read these required resources um, on Canvas. The quiz will be based heavily on um, these uh, resources, which are all available on Canvas. All right, and this is the end of part one. Thanks so much for joining me.